Hi, everyone. So for our group presentation, our group decided to choose COVID and how that disproportionately plays in the POC community. My name is Vanessa and my group members are Katie, Jake, and Trevor. So to start off this presentation, we do wanna talk about what the problem is and who it affects. So as many of us know, COVID is a worldwide pandemic affecting many, many lives. Um, in the United States alone, those who are being most affected by the virus are racial and ethnic minority groups, specifically people of color. Um, people of color are having higher rates of death and cases than their share population. Um, in the left corner here, I have a definition for POC, person of color, a person who is not white or of European percentage. So POC are being greatly affected due to factors such as healthcare access, occupation, education, income, housing, et cetera. There's just so, so much that plays into this, so many confounding factors and a lot of history in the United States really. Um, but we can go on forever to talk about that, but we will only be discussing a few things. So we will be discussing immigration issues, racism, discrimination, stereotypes of youth and health disparities and how that has played a huge role on the issue. Okay, so we got some stats here. Um, Latinx, Black, and additional groups are all being greatly affected. Many of these populations are being affected more than their shared population. As you can see in this graph, um, Black, Hispanic, Asian, Na Native American community are having higher rates of death and cases than their shared population. So the gray is their shared population, the red orange is the deaths percentage of deaths and the orange is the share of cases, which is crazy if you see that. Um, African Americans continue to get infected and die from COVID at rates more than 1.5 times than their share of population. Um, in Missouri, Kansas, Wisconsin, Michigan, African Americans are dying at a rate more than 2. Point times their share of population. Um, increasingly, Hispanic and Latinos die from COVID-19 at rates higher than their share of state populations. In May, this was true in only seven states, but now it is true in 19 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, the Native Americans and Alaska, Alaska Native share of death and sickness is disproportionate to their population in 21 states out of the 36 states with sufficient data. That rate is five or more times greater than population share in Utah, Montana, New Mexico, and Wyoming. White and non-Hispanic deaths from COVID are lower than their share of population in 36 states of the District of Columbia, which is crazy. Um, in a peer review called Reaching the Hispanic Community about COVID-19 through existing chronic disease prevention program, um, said that the CDC's weighted population data shows that over 26% of US COVID-19 deaths were among Hispanic people um, who represent only 18% of the total US population. Um, in Pennsylvania, where Hispanic people are 7.6% of total state population, 11% of COVID-19 deaths were among Hispanic people when applying weighted population dis distributions. Um, the vulnerability, vulnerability of Hispanic communities to COVID-19 can rise from many factors, including differential exposure, susceptibility, and access to healthcare, which healthcare is one of the huge and main issues of this. Um, so health disparities correlate to confounding factors, so such as lack of transportation. Sometimes people don't have cars. They can't afford to pay for the buses, um, they can't afford for childcare um, or have people babysit for them. You know, they don't have extra resources for that. They can't ask for time off because they need the money, language barriers. Sometimes people don't know English. And when, so when they come to these clinics, they can't exactly tell them what they need. Um, discrimination is a huge role. Trust issues with healthcare, such as the test. Tuskegee study and sterilization without permission for those being sterilized. All these can create 
a huge level of stress, specifically chronic stress that compromises the immune system, makes them more vulnerable to COVID-19. With the spread of COVID-19 has come a wave of blatant racism leading to immigration issues, discrimination and stereotypes, and as we just spoke about, extreme health disparities. Um, I just want to offer a quick trigger warning. In the next slide, I will be showing a picture from an ICE detention center. ICE detention centers, though already extremely inhumane, have gotten much worse since the outbreak of COVID-19. Being held to almost no level of accountability, the usual channels of oversight and accountability have been put on pause, and detained immigrants are left extremely vulnerable to contracting the virus. ICE has now banned its congressional oversight tours at all detention centers throughout the country, put greater barriers to attorney access in place, and stopped any form of social or family visits. There isn't much of a way to get any information in or out of the detention centers besides through ICE uh, employees themselves. The issue is that ICE is not reporting accurate health information about the detainees or even the staff. According to the ACLU, although ICE has reported the number of people who have tested positive for COVID-19 at only specific facilities, it has not provided information as to how many people at each facility have been tested, which is critical information to understand how widespread the virus is. Even further, ICE has posted data where the additional number of confirmed cases of COVID was more than the, the additional number of people even tested. And in one account of someone with a temperature of, 90, of below 95 degrees, which uh, would indicate hypothermia. This leads officials to believe that ICE is fabricating many aspects of their health reports on detainees and many living in these extremely close and unhealthy living conditions are put in, at an extreme risk. Moving on to racism, discrimination, and stereotypes. Another group that has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 is Asian Americans. When COVID-19 started becoming a serious problem in America, Donald Trump decided to coin the terms China virus and Kung flu instead of using the proper names for the virus and actually continues to do so in the present day. I'm sure you're well aware. Many people think these are just words and other than being kind of offensive, it's relatively harmless. Uh, but names like these have actually incited violence against Asian Americans at an extremely high rate, um, with 2,700 cases of assault against Asian Americans being reported since the start of the pandemic, and over half of them actually happening in our own back door in California. Uh, this virus has become racialized which is a process the ADAA describes as a process by which all individuals from a certain background are grouped together due to perceived biological characteristics. Because of racialization, anyone with an East Asian background has become associated with the virus. Asian Americans have nothing to do with this virus, yet they are the ones being directly blamed for it here in the U.S. George Takei, in an NPR podcast on Asian American discrimination and coronavirus, gave his personal experience with the virus, stating, quote, In the case of many Chinese American friends, it's their great-great-grandparents that came from China. And still, we are compared in the context of our ancestral land. Yes, there are a lot of first-generation and second-generation Asian Americans, but it's the same as with our German or Italian or Irish friends. They have been here a long time and they are part of America, despite the fact that we still have immigration, immigrants coming from Germany or Italy or Ireland. So why are Asian Americans subject to this blatant racism, stereotyping and discrimination? Well, white Americans have made it very clear through coronavirus racism that Asian Americans are only the model minority when it's convenient to them. As stated earlier, COVID-19 has impacted people of color on a much larger scale than it has with white people. In the case of the rise in hate crimes, racism, and discrimination against Asian Americans, one of the best things they could do for themselves during this pandemic would be to find solace in their own communities. With COVID isolating everyone from one another, Asian Americans who have been victims of hate crimes may feel even more alone than ever. 
being able to find support in others who are going through the same things as you are could help the victims realize that they are not struggling alone. Having a safe place to share their emotions in an environment that they know will be supportive and non-judgmental towards their situations could be very therapeutic. It may also help them deal with any stress they may be having, as well as inspire a feeling of being united during this pandemic. If victims wanted to pursue legal action, new specific government policies could be implemented to help deal with the discrimination towards Asians as a result of the pandemic. While California does have race as a protected class, it's all too common for cases of harassment and assault to go unresolved in legal settings. One of the most common reasons for this is due to insufficient evidence. Improved investigation and prosecution efforts could help victims get the justice they deserve. There are several ways that the spread of COVID can be slowed down in minority communities. Many of the issues present are purely structural rather than genetic. One of these intervention strategies could be to implement a comprehensive stimulus program. This may help slow the spread of the virus due to the way that it incentivizes people to stay home, especially if they are already feeling symptoms. As it is, people of color are overrepresented in essential jobs. This is mainly due to the fact that many cannot afford to stay home right now. People of color often face low income and high poverty rates. A survey conducted by NPR, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health reported that 72% of Latino, 60% of Black, and 55% of Native American households were all facing severe financial problems during the coronavirus outbreak. This was in contrast to only 36% of white people reporting struggles with finances. For ethnic minorities, this means that in order for them to pay their rent or afford essential items like food and medication, they would have no other choice but to keep attending work. Even if they are sick, they will have to go because it's either that or they possibly lose their income or job. However, with a comprehensive stimulus program in place, this may ease some of the financial struggles that they may have been facing. If individuals are getting a stimulus check, they may be more likely to not attend work if they're feeling sick, thus minimizing the spread of COVID in the workplace. They may also even be able to take some time off from their job, reducing the risk even further. The World Health Organization once stated that no one should get sick and die just because they are poor or because they cannot access the health services they need. Universal health care should be a human right. It has been shown time and time again that people of color are often unable to access health care as often as white people. There are several reasons for this, but one of the most common is a lack of finances. With universal health care, they could see a medical professional without needing to worry about that. They could have routine checkups that could find underlying health conditions that are making them more susceptible to contracting covid if they do become sick, they could also get help without having to worry about the hospital bill putting them in debt. Another issue, though, that is sometimes brought up by people of color is that they distrust doctors due to the way that they can judge um, their patients based off race. Just recently, a 56-year-old black man named Gary Fowler was denied COVID testing on three separate occasions, despite having all of the symptoms and begging for help. He ended up dying from the vi virus a few days later. The systematic way that people of color are often brushed off in the medical field can instill a distrust in medical professionals as a whole. This is why creating private organizations that specialize in conducting health care and COVID tests and contact tracing in communities may be a viable option. Privatization helps decrease some of the fear that many may have of the government. It allows them to get important health services without having to worry. Important health information can also be shared with the communities that need it the most. An example of a private organization would be the Black Doctors COVID-19 Consortium, led by pediatric sur surgeon Dr. Alla Stanford. Dr. Stanford is an African-American woman who is going out into Black communities with her colleagues and testing them for COVID-19 free of charge. She also is providing important educational information about the virus to them. Okay, so to kind of uh, wrap up our presentation, um, 
going back over the main problem that we are addressing during this presentation is that uh, people of color experience higher rates of death and infection due to COVID-19 than their share of the population. And factors like immigration issues, racism, discrimination, uh, stereotypes and health disparities all play massive roles in this. And um, <clears throat> so essentially, the most vulnerable individuals in our society are being impacted at the highest rates by coronavirus. And uh, that includes people of color. Uh, based on the structure of our country, it really should not have been a surprise, in my opinion, that this is the case. Uh, these individuals are not vulnerable by their very nature, uh, but factors like systematic oppression and a lack of access to resources like healthcare or adequate income um, it has made these people of color very vulnerable to this disease in our country. And it's just quite unfortunate, I have to say, that it took a global pandemic for us to like truly expose these issues in our country. And uh, the main interventions that we uh, talked about in this presentation um, include uh, interventions in areas of social support, uh, streamlined prosecution of hate crimes, stimulus programs, and healthcare. So in a time like this, uh, I think it's really important to do everything you can to kind of shed the devout individualism that um, the United States really emphasizes. And um, in a, in a, during a pandemic, it's really about the collective. We need, to, we need to start focusing on how we can help our neighbors and help the people in our society, especially individuals that are less fortunate and are at higher risk to suffering at the hands of this disease. This is not a time uh, in our country where we need to be focusing on the equal distribution of resources. Uh, people of color in our country need more help like, flat out than most other groups. So the, um, the response both from us at a personal level and on the, uh, the governing level needs to be uh, as such. Okay, so on to some things that we as individuals can all do to uh, try to help this problem. The first point I'll make is that we need to spread love, not coronavirus. Um, th this, I mean this to say that during a pandemic when we really are more disconnected from one another um, than, than than ever before, um, we, we need to really place an emphasis on social support and especially being there for the people in our life that may fit into some of the um, the categorizations that uh, the categorizations of people that are um, adversely affected by this virus. And um, in addition to that, in addition to helping our peers, uh, we can give whatever we can to COVID-19 relief organizations. There's many great charities and nonprofit organizations out there that are doing ground level work to try to help, um, <clears throat> excuse me, try to help solve this problem in uh, predominantly uh, minority communities. Um, and this doesn't have to be donating your money. I'm well aware that not everyone has money to donate, you know, so, volunteering could be another option you know you you don't money isn't the only thing that you can donate it, and um, the final point that i would make is uh you need to spread this information amongst your peers um the information and knowledge is power and we can't do anything about this problem if we don't even acknowledge its existence so the more people that are on board the better Okay, and finally, I want to leave you all with some parting questions. So uh, the first thing I would say is that I would ask you all to examine your privilege as it relates to this issue. And what I mean by that are, are you truly doing everything you can to help stop the spread of this disease? Now, whatever your privilege in, entails as it relates to this issue, be it you are in a good enough financial position to not have to go out and support your fa a family or your loved ones, and you have uh, the privilege of being able to isolate yourself. And so I would just simply ask that whatever um, uh, privileges you have as it relates to this pandemic, you, you need to be aware of them, you need to be conscious of them. And if you are in a position to stay home and be able to isolate yourself from others, then I would ask, are you 
actually doing so. Um, like I previously said, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to stay home. And so if you have that ability, if you are able to do so and not risk your health, then I would implore you to do so because the more people that we can get in this country and across the world to stay home, not see people, not spread the virus. I mean, the, the quicker that this is going to go away and the quicker that we can get back to living our lives the way they want, the way that we want to. And then finally, I'll leave you all um, with the question of, are you doing okay? This is kind of a, a heavy presentation that we've just gone through about a heavy topic. And there's every chance that many of you in our class could be experiencing some of the um, adverse effects that, that we were kind of talking about in this presentation. So if indeed you feel that you're in a position where you need help, whatever that may entail, maybe just a friend to talk to, whatever it may be, then I would implore you to please reach out and please don't hesitate to ask for that help. We're all in this together. Like I said, we need to be um, placing a higher emphasis on collectivism during this time. And yeah, so ask for help. I hope, I hope everyone's doing all right. Um, thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Everyone have a good day.